something happens. Now, just to be clear, my wife, hope my wife can testify to this. That dog that, that used to bark a lot, she don't hear too much anymore. But in our early days, oh yeah, there was barking, there was there was scratching, there was fussing, there was fighting, probably a little, a little bit of cursing on the side, but not on the top. Then along came Jesus. But every once in a while, come on, be honest, every once in a while, the dog comes out. Some of us in here right now, you need to repent because you're busy barking when you need to be on your knees crying before the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me a sinner. Amen? Amen. Somebody put a leash on that dog, right? <laughs> Keith Green learned that those who have, been, have forgiven, been forgiven much, they can love much. Sadly, though, in 1982, I can still remember this, because this is when we, we were fairly fresh in the church. In 1982, just a few months after his 29th birthday, Keith Green died in a plane crash. And I say that, and the reason I can remember some of this is because it was just about that time, I would have to say that I... At that moment, or that time in my life, was becoming a Christian. Watch this. Just believing in Jesus does not make one a Christian. Just, just, watch this. Just believing in God does not make one a Christian. Just knowing the word of God does not make one a Christian. Just knowing how to preach the word or teach the word. Just knowing how to sing the songs does not make one a Christian. Amen? Amen. How many of you know that the devil and demons, they know, they know God, they know Jesus. Are they Christian? No. So let's go, now we're talking about Keith Green, but let's talk about the author of this song, King David. Create in me a clean heart. It's a pretty simple song. It's based on verses 10, 11, and 12 in Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart. Heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Sing it, church. Cast me not away from your presence, O oh Lord. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and renew a right spirit within me. Here's the deal. It is essentially a prayer conversation. Yes. And the prayer that David is praying right now is the Lord change me. Mm -hmm. Change me from the inside out. Not just to make me look like a Christian. Not just to make, well, in his case, don't just make me look like one of yours. I want to be one of yours. Amen. Amen. Now, the subtitle of Psalm 51 in, in, uh, in where my Bible said, a psalm of David when the prophet Nathan came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Now, to kind of put you in the picture uh, that David has by this stage, uh, he's been king for a number of years. He's enjoyed quite a bit of success, kind of like our, our, our buddy Mr. Green. But while in, in his army is away fighting, David stays home at the palace. The soldiers are out, the commanders are out, they're all out there fighting, and they're all out there protecting the palace. But one evening, he looks out over the balcony and he sees something. Or should I say he sees someone, he has a vision. And it wasn't, are you with me? And it's, this vision is a beautiful woman. And she's bathing. Now like the Bruce Springsteen thought song, some of you might know about this music, David is on fire. He's got to have this girl. Maybe, maybe it is the loneliness of leadership. Maybe it's the corrupting influence of power. Or maybe David has simply grown complacent in his prosperity. They're out fighting the battles. How I many you know David in his history, he was known to be a warrior. He was known to be a man who could fight fights. That, and that was one of, the, one of the problems that Saul had with him. Because he David comes back, and they said Saul has killed his thousands, David has killed his ten thousands. 
Maybe he's just a little complacent. We're kind of sitting back in a life of luxury. Amen? Whatever the reason, David must have this woman. He's got, he's got to have her. So he invites her up to his room. And her name is Bathsheba. One thing leads to another, and here's what happens. Bathsheba is now with child. Now, this is not a good look for David. This isn't going to fly well. This, as it turns out, is the wife of one of his commanders. So David wants to cover his tracks and, and hide what he's done. Bathsheba is married to Uriah the Hittite, and, and Uriah, he's a good guy. He's actually fighting in David's army. So David calls Uriah back from the front line, and what he does, he tries to get him, he tries to get him snookered up a little bit, just you know, get him to drink a little bit, and then he sends him home in hopes that he'll go out and he'll sleep with his wife. That way, nobody would be the wiser to know what David had done. Everybody would think that that baby was Uriah's. Well, not quite everybody. Turn to David and say, God knows. God knows. But David puts God out of his mind. David behaves as though God doesn't even exist. You know what we call that? We call that practical atheism. Unfortunately for David, though, Uriah, this, 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 this warrior, this soldier, he's a real boy scout. I mean, instead of going home to get reacquainted with his wife, Uriah sleeps on the doorstep of David's palace. And the reason is he just can't stand the thought of taking any comfort for himself, watch this, while his brothers in arms are sleeping and rough, they're, they're roughing it out in a foxhole someplace. So this means that David has to resort to plan B. Plan B is like this. He sends Uriah back to the front line and a messenger follows. So the message is for Joab, the commander of David's army. David wants Joab to put Uriah where the fighting is the heaviest and then fall back. Put him out there on the front lines. Fall back to where to Uriah has no protection. He's got no backup. He's got no support. And you know what happens? The enemy kills him. Now, Joab is a soldier, so he follows the orders, and it is done. Here Uriah dies in battle, and after that time of mourning, Bathsheba becomes David's wife. Pretty good cover-up, isn't it? But someone tell me this. God knows. God knows. David thinks that he's in the clear, but God knows. Oh, he's having trouble sleeping at night. You know, like Lady Macbeth, and some of you have no idea what I'm about to say. Lady Macbeth, where he just can't seem to get rid of that spot. But at least his reputation is intact. Nobody is the wiser. Then the man named Nathan, a prophet, he shows up. Now, what Nathan is wise in his approach, he doesn't confront the issue head on. Uh, that would make David angry and defensive and perhaps might get him killed. Uh, <laughs> Instead, Nathan goes to, uh, he goes for the sucker punch. I guess that's the way to put it. He tells David this story. Listen to the story. There are two men who lived in the same town. One was rich and the other poor. The rich man had many cattle and sheep, while the poor man had only one lamb, which he had bought. He took care of it, he, uh, and he grew up in his home with his children. He would feed it some of his own food and let it drink from his cup and also hold it in his lap. The lamb was like a daughter to him. One day a visitor arrived at the rich man's home and the rich man didn't want to kill one of his own animals to fix a meal for him. Instead, he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it as a meal for the guests. David's response, according to the scripture, he became very angry at that rich man. He said, I swear by the living Lord that that man who did this, he ought to die. He should, he should be put to death for having done such a cruel thing. 